very good evening to all of you. On behalf of Bangalore Chamber of Industry and Commerce, we welcome you all for this exclusive session on leadership dimensions. I'm Rupa, I'm the secretary at BCIC. The session is organized under the aegis of Industry Institute Interface and EduTech Expert Committee of the Chamber. A hearty welcome to Mr. Viju Parameshwar, who is a former president and CEO of Kluber Lubric uh, Lubrication. A hearty welcome to you, sir. Thank you very much for accepting our invitation. Um, we also welcome our office bearers, Dr. Devrajan, who is a senior okay. vice president, and Mr. Vineet Verma, who is our vice president. Okay. Welcome, sir. The 3I expert committee of the chamber is led by Dr. Okay. N.R. Parshuraman, who is the director of Sri Dharmasthala Manjunateshwara Institute of Management Development. Co-chaired by Dr. Chetan Singhai, who is the director, Ramaya Public Policy Center of Bengaluru, and Mr. Sunil Telkar, managing partner, Aspiro Consulting LLP. The committee is mentored by Dr. K. N. Subramanya, who is the principal of RV College of Engineering. I once again thank all the participants for joining this session. And now I hand over the platform to Dr. Parameshwaran. And before that, I would like to acknowledge the sponsors of various events for this year mrs bueller funder max mtr iampl sona group sdmimd who is the knowledge partner tbs vishwas group of companies and vipro thank you once again and over to you dr parmesh dr parshuraman sir thank you thank you thank you rupa and a very warm welcome to all of you for this leadership session. Uh, this is the second of the talks that has been organized by the Industry Academia interface. And we, we felt that we should uh, have a different topic, a topic on leadership. And uh, can't really find a better person than Mr. Viju Parameshwar for handling this particular session. Had a, he has had a very illustrious uh, career as uh, CEO of Kluber Lubrications, and he has uh, wide multinational exposure during his illustrious career. But apart from that, he's a very widely read person, and he continues to have his interest in ESG as well as in banking and a variety of other sectors as well. I know all this firsthand because he's also a member you know, until recently of our governing board. And uh, we have had uh, benefited a great deal by his, from his uh, knowledge and wide experience. Uh, so I just want me to, okay, right, yeah. I, I'll start all over again. I said very, very warm welcome to all of you for this second lecture on industry from organized by the Industry Academy Interface of BCIC. Uh, this time the talk is going to be on leadership dimensions by Mr. Viju Parameshwar, who has had a very illustrious career as culminating as CEO of Kluber. And before that, of course, has had such wide multinational experience in various leadership roles. Uh, he's a very widely read person and his special areas of interest currently are ESG, banking and a variety of other topics as well. I know all this firsthand because he was a member until very recently of our governing board and we have benefited a great deal by his vast experience and expertise in several aspects of running a management school and deciding on our curriculum and strategic dimensions. Uh, very warm welcome to you, Mr. Viju Parameshwar, and uh, it's over to you now. <clears throat> thank you. Thank you, Dr. Parishraman. Good afternoon, everyone. Pleasure to be here. Let me try and share my presentation. Just tell me if it works. Is it working? Not so far. What do I need to do? It was quite OK in the rehearsal. No, not yet. All you have to do is 
click on the share screen and I hope already the presentation is open in your desktop. Yeah, now get a blank screen right now. We still have not got this. We have just no, it's come. Now. It's come. Now. It's working. It's, work. it's visible. Okay. Sir. It's working. Right. It's working. Yeah. Okay. Right. Uh, so uh, this is, I understand, an interface between industry and academia. And uh, it's most appropriate because unlike any other science, management science is, in fact, arising from practice. It's an attempt to uh, do research and formalize the practice. And therefore, it's very much a practical field. However, unlike uh, some parts of management science, leadership has very little formal theory. And therefore, most books on leadership you will see are uh, what I call hero studies, you know, uh, lives or biographies of, of heroic figures who are supposed to have been great leaders with an attempt to sort of list down what they did and try to learn. But since there's therefore very little that's accepted as formal theory, I will simply talk about what I learned during 40 plus years of, uh, of managing uh, in a corporate, in my corporate life. And I, I'm not going to try and be comprehensive. These are just a few random thoughts that occur to me, which I think are worth mentioning. First, let me start before getting into more, uh, you know, the theory or esoteric concepts with three uh, quick tips for everyone. The first is how do you get promoted when you're in a job? Now, most of the time when you enter, when you start a new role, uh, there's a period when we are struggling to manage. Okay, we're not able to fully get on top of the job. And then gradually one gets familiar and is able to completely do the job in a, in a full proper way. Depending on the level, it may take a year, year and a half to get to the second phase. And then another year or two, you're you know, fully on top of your job. Now, then you reach a phase where you're able to manage your job with relatively little effort and possibly with time to spare. When you reach that stage, um, the ideal situation is that you start doing your boss's, some or more of your boss's tasks. As you do more and more of them, uh, it becomes apparent to everyone that, in fact, you're ready to do your boss's job and you more or less automatically get promoted. This is a, a thing that I have seen happening repeatedly when, when people who uh, take the trouble to, to sort of gradually in, increase their own responsibilities by doing their boss's jobs, then they get promoted. There's, it's not a formal way. You don't ask for it. You just start gradually doing things. And normally, bosses are happy to let you do them. So this is one tip. The second I found recently in the last few years, um, there is a um, particularly with the whole startup culture, uh, people tend to get to CXO positions very early in their lives. And quite often having, let's say, become a CXO at 30 something, when they are 50 odd and they're a CXO of maybe a larger company, their performance is not as good as those who did not become CXOs that early because they did more different roles during their careers which built a sounder foundation and a greater level of knowledge. Uh, some of you might find this um, a little blasphemous, but I believe that uh, there is, it's sometimes uh, there's a point when you become a CXO too early in life, and that may be a mixed blessing. Let me give you an example. Suppose you're a finance professional, and uh, let's say you've done uh, one job in uh, in a branch sales branch so you get familiar with the accounting of sales of uh, value added tax uh, of things of that type maybe of transportation logistics and the whole collection mechanisms and things like that <clears throat> and then after a few years there suppose you move to the uh, head office of your company 
and very soon suppose you become the uh, C, uh, the CFO now your knowledge about factory accounting your knowledge about um, uh, let's say treasury raising funds are all likely to be weak and therefore and once you become a CXO it's very difficult to learn some of these things because there are other people actually doing the job and over a period of five ten years on the job as a CXO you tend to then be uh, found wanting in some of these aspects in your knowledge so I believe that, uh, that there's a right time to to uh, get to that point you know that you should spend more number of years learning aspects of your job or of your function that you haven't uh, yet learned so you should plan your career moves uh, based on the areas that you feel need uh, you know where you have gaps in your learning and a role that will provide that will fill those gaps will help you ultimately to be a much better all-round uh, head of that function so that's my second tip third is uh, is the whole uh, you know issue of are you doing the right things how are you prioritizing your time so broadly if you look at any role there are three kinds of things that we need to do in a job the first is things that are involving our ourselves that is tasks that we have to do by ourselves the second is tasks we have to do to manage others that may be um, you know delegating tasks maybe monitoring the performance of subordinates it may be planning things it may be uh, a whole lot of things of that type and the third is what you call leading as different from managing and if you were to make a pie chart of your of the time that you spend doing each of these things most people as they are getting promoted need to do more leading in their in the higher level job as compared to what they were doing in their lower level job so let's say if you're a salesperson a frontline salesperson for argument's sake or a frontline um, uh, manufacturing person then you're likely to be doing a whole lot of uh, self tasks things that you do on your own now, as you get promoted to a first level supervision you now have to do a lot of things that are managing others but the tendency is to keep doing the things you were doing before that got you the promotion and as you go up the, the, the ranks, you need to do more and more of leading and less and less of uh, the other parts. If you are not able to think about this correctly and prioritize and allocate your time in an appropriate way to each of the three areas, um, you may not be very successful. So one of the things that, um, that I have found useful is to actually note down every few months maybe what percentage of your time you think you're spending on each of these three areas and to start with uh, put down what you think is an appropriate um, you know ideal proportion of time to be spent on each of these three and see how close you're coming to that uh, if you do this the chances are that you will uh, better uh, manage your job and that you'll be doing the right things rather than doing the wrong things in a in a good efficient way okay coming to what i think leadership issues are first of all uh, leadership as you all know is is a, is something to do with people we are leading people so it's a highly people focused um, uh, set of uh, things it's not so much task or goal oriented what you might call more soft things less hard things more software than hardware and uh, by definition to have to be a leader you need a follower followers need leaders equally leaders need followers so there has to be something that makes people follow the leader and uh, unlike a managerial role let's say somebody is appointed as manager of so and so department leaders are typically not appointed leaders emerge from uh, from in any organization at different levels not necessarily linked to their uh, position or hierarchy so quite often you can have somebody 
uh, much lower down the hierarchy uh, that who tends to automatically do leadership things when you when you map where people are speaking to whom in an organization how often and what kind of issues they take to whom in an organization you will find that it is not necessarily following the hierarchy so there are some people who everybody seems to go to automatically uh, for advice for you know for whatever for just for consultation for uh, mentoring and those people are in a sense the the leaders and they may or may not be in a hierarchical leadership position so it's important to recognize that every person at every point at every level in an organization has some leadership uh, in them and can take on leadership roles and this of course while we are talking in this context primarily on corporate organizations it applies equally to any kind of organization all the famous leaders in the world are you know came out of uh, out of politics out of uh, out of armed forces and people and places like that so it could be anywhere obviously if you are if leadership has to do with um, with people then largely it's an internally focused um, uh, activity because we are looking at the people in the organization that we are that we are leading is how to ensure that all the people in an organization are working to their full potential how do you do that ensure that people are trained developed coached so that they can uh, achieve their full potential provide an environment and culture where people can focus on performance without insecurity and fear so these are the two main things therefore culture creation i think is one of the uh, big tasks of of leadership and the development of people having said that uh, leaders also need to have a significant amount of external contacts in order to provide the eyes and ears to the environment to see what's going on and uh, this includes of course a lot of reading so the job doesn't end uh, during the time that you spend in at work it includes uh, you know networking after that it includes reading time and so on this must be taken on formally <coughs> okay let's look at these are some of the key aspects of leadership that i feel are worth emphasizing the first we already talked about it means focus on people after all followers need the leaders leaders need the followers how do you deal with people if people is a big task of leadership fundamentally a leader needs to be interested in people must have empathy must have the desire to do a good job for the people this can of course there are many styles of leadership that you would have read about there can be um, you know authoritarian disciplinarian tough etc types there can be very soft types you have to decide what your own style is but whichever your style is if you don't love your people in a sense you don't care for them then you're not likely to spend the time to help them and therefore you won't be a good leader whatever your style so love is not necessarily a uh, an aspect that means that you can't be tough you can also have tough love but basic uh, requirement is that you want and are interested in people so i think that's it and it's very difficult for people to for leaders to follow an alien style so in my opinion you have to be true to yourself whatever you find comfortable your style has to reflect that these days there's a lot of literature about being true to yourself and all that coming out of the pandemic but i think it was always true uh, if you're a type of person who essentially is um, is a tough kind of managing through toughness the theory x types uh, it will it will you'll be seen through if you're if you're only pretending to be the other way around or vice versa 
So I think that you need to be um, to be true to your own style. But having said that, society these days uh, doesn't easily accept the the, the authoritarian styles that uh, that prevailed 40 years ago when we were young. And and one needs to adjust to whatever that uh, requirement is. The second aspect I think is values. Um, a lot of uh, talk recently about uh, <clears throat> ESG and stakeholder capitalism and so on. Again, I think these are these have always been true. Uh, people want to work for organizations that uh, that do what they consider good for the for the for the environment for the society around and uh, make them proud so the purpose that that people uh, are interested in purpose you know purpose focused organizations means that your leadership style must embody values <clears throat> um, now before you ask me were well, hitler and trump and so on great uh, great leaders they had the ability to lead but you see you can you can appeal to people's base instincts to their and you can easily get a large number of followers by emphasizing negative things that is the i mean hate and negative aspects of a human of human nature is something that is relatively easy to focus on and through that to get common uh, common groups and uh, to follow one but at the end of the day that does not sustain um, anything in society uh, that you know sustainable effects on society that you want to make and society can include uh, an organization in a small in a microcosm is, is a society uh, if you appeal to the better aspects of human nature try to make people better try to make them focus on the better parts of their character and work to that, the chances of building sustainability into an organization of lasting effects of that culture are much greater. And obviously examples are people like Gandhi. In order to do the second is far, is a slower process and far more difficult than doing the first kind of leadership. It needs clarity in all the leaders and communication of that clarity of why, what are your values, why are you following them, and why it's worth the effort. And a lot of self-security because there'll be a lot of doubts raised in the on the journey. And the important thing is if you're following, if you want to be value-based, then the means are as important as the ends. Which means that if you have a target for argument's sake of putting up a new plant somewhere, and in the process, you're getting uh, delayed by bureaucracy. Uh, a bit of speed money might get you to your target faster. But since the means are equally important, you're trying to build a culture, any even small violation of that value will be seen by everybody and will gradually corrode and destroy uh, the culture that one is trying to build. So it's very important that we are consistent in small and big things in following one's values. The net, next aspect of good leadership, and I think this is true all over the world, most CEOs and CXOs um, have inflated egos, have inflated views about themselves. And that tends to drive poor decision making, whether it is in m and whether it is in, in sticking to you know, wrong decisions simply because one can't admit that one made a mistake in the past. There are a lot of different things that uh, egos. And also, you can't truly be uh, empathetic to all the people in an organization if you're looking down upon them. So I think the one of the greatest things uh, the single most important thing I have found is how do you control one's ego? Now, there is no way that you will not have ego. Ego is what has driven performance in most people. The, the question is how do you how do you keep it? How do you how do you make yourself aware of it? Self-awareness of that ego and keeping it under control is what's important.
So one has one way to think about this. I don't particularly like this word servant in the servant leadership, but you must have heard of this concept. Uh, one way to manage uh, egos in, in senior people is to think about who actually is at the coal face doing all the operations. Who's actually selling the product? Who's manufacturing the product? Who is uh, doing the accounting of, of all that? You know, so there's a bunch of people who are who every day make every activity in an organization tick. Even for a minute, if those people were not doing their job, the, the organization won't function. On the other hand, the senior management, if they were not there for a week or two weeks, nothing will change. The organization will continue to run. So in a sense, they are, they are creating and, and, and enabling the doers to do their work better. And if you think of it that way, then you will think of yourself as, as, um, as support and enabling rather than the per person who is driving everything. And I think that is a, a way to control one's ego. Uh, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a war, the general is rarely right out in front. There are people out there who are actually doing the fighting and, um, and, and dying. And the generals are, are planning strategy from a relatively safe position at the back. So this is the way you can, if you recognize that, you can, I think, see yourself and your role as a senior person in a, in a more balanced way. The next uh, aspect of things is, as I already mentioned earlier, an environment where people can perform requires people to be secure. How do you ensure that there's no fear and there is a high level of security? Um, there's a famous author called Simon Sinek who writes a lot on this, on this topic of providing security. Uh, I think the best way for me is to give you two stories from my own life. In the first case, I was new in a, in a company. I had the opportunity to buy a large amount of raw material, which appeared to be uh, of good quality and very cheap. But the quantity I had to buy was huge. I could not contact anyone. We are talking about 40 years ago when long distance calls were very difficult to make and so on. So I just took the decision and I bought a large amount of money uh, of this raw material. <clears throat> uh, soon I got a letter pulling me up saying that this is you know outside the policy of the company blah 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 i didn't have the authority and all that before i could uh, decide what to answer i was obviously under tension whether this is going to you know put me into trouble am i going to lose my job i'm new in the company blah 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 uh, a letter came from our common boss the head of the business that uh, although it may be a violation of the rules it was a very good buy and such entrepreneurial initiative should be encouraged and so on, essentially providing me um, great uh, relief on that occasion, but also providing me the security to feel that I could take decisions and move forward without worrying too much about bureaucracy. I think that's an ideal, it's an ideal, it's an example of, an, of how, um, you know, how uh, you can change a person's attitude towards work and make them a high performer as compared to if they had, if this had not been the response and uh, then i would have always been scared about taking decisions in future another story a few years later <clears throat> uh, i was in charge of a business uh, selling products worldwide and i had just taken over when we got multiple complaints from customers around the world with formal claims for millions of dollars. It means that we have to pay millions of dollars. Um, I confided with colleague, one or two colleagues and said, you know, this is the situation. What do you think I should do? And all of them said, if you tell your boss, you'll get sacked. So that was the prevailing culture, obviously, at the time. So I sort of sat on it for a couple of days, didn't know what to do, and I was losing sleep. I didn't know. I was very un you know, uncomfortable with the whole situation. At that point, uh, the boss got transferred and, and a new boss came in who I felt uh, a little more comfortable with. 
So I went in and told them this is the situation. All these claims have come in. <clears throat> the immediate response of this boss, as well as his boss, uh, was that don't worry about it. It's not your personal problem. We will all let's sit together, find solutions, and and we found the solution. So another example of how you can ease fear and tension in, in subordinates' minds. And the final point uh, I wanted to make uh, has to do with uh, inequality. Now, as you know, worldwide inequality in, in many countries has been increasing. It's happening in India. If you look at the bottom table, and I've purposely not uh, put latest figures because of uh, you know disputes about uh, statistics across the country. But uh, if you if you were to refer to latest figures, you will find that uh, India has moved to around 0 0.4, 0 0.41 in, in the last couple of years. So our um, our inequality is increasing, and that's true all over the world. And there is a strong view uh, by experts across the world that the rise of of right wing populist nationalists is uh, partially at least the result of this inequality increase and that uh, it that it's one of the threats to democracy if you accept that and i do i think within our limited sphere we can't do too much about the overall society's inequality but a part of it is coming from the corporate world over the last uh, 20 30 years the increase of remuneration at the top of uh, of all private organizations has been disproportionately higher than the increase at the lower levels and therefore the ratio of low to high of the lower levels to the ceo cxo has been continuously increasing in india it was already the case in uh, the anglo saxon world where also it increased in the last 10 20 years but there are a large number of countries where this is not the case. And I've put down here Germany and a few other surrounding countries where the ratios are very much lower. So you can see that in Germany, the difference from the lowest to the highest in a typical company is maybe 10 times, whereas in India, it could be 250 times. Uh, and this is uh, not only does it contribute to this whole inequality, it uh, mitigates it, it makes it very difficult to create a culture in an organization where everybody is pulling together because lower level people are uh, are likely to look at this difference and say what's going on what's more when there's a downturn and recently you may have read of many companies who are laying off workers think about um, think about a situation where you lay off the you know when you're laying off, typically they're lower level people. If the top in any company, the top four or five people, if they were to take a 10% cut in their remuneration, the chances are that will be equal to 20 people or 30 people being laid off their entire salaries. And if you were to take that route rather than laying off people, uh, it will uh, generate a huge amount of goodwill and it will be good for business in the long run because the, after the downturn is over, you want to again recruit and you find it very difficult to get trained people uh, having laid off your trained people to start with. So um, just as one example, I think this is a philosophically important issue. Senior management and associations like BCIC and CIA must think about it carefully rather than, um, you know, rather than currently the hype that is made about uh, people people's high salaries sal high salaries coming out of uh, i don't know iims iits the whole thing about uh, hyping up salaries talking about how many billionaires we are producing and so on are all things that are likely to cause uh, discomfort to the lower levels of society and i think we need to take a serious note about this So about uh, 25, 30 years ago, I evolved from all these 
my thinking. Uh, four statements that I thought encapsulate all the good stuff that we should be doing. And I tried to, uh, I tried in any organization that I was to say these, if we can achieve these four things, then we'll be, uh, you know, we'll be an ideal place. The first is we need to be a high performing organization or team. That's kind of obvious, right? We need performance. How are we going to get there? The second thing is where the mind is without fear. We need to have a culture where there's no fear, where everyone behaves like the owner. And this is an important thing. You, you're unlikely to have bureaucracy and incorrect thinking if everyone thinks they are the owner. So what does it mean? It means if you're leaving the room, you put off the light. You don't say, oh, this is company's money. Why should I bother? You know, anytime in any organization, if you hear people saying, why are you concerned about the cost? It's after all paid by the company. Uh, I think that company is in trouble. So everybody has to, if everybody thinks of that money the same as they would of their own money, as if they are the owner, you're going to have a great, uh, efficient, well-run and, uh, and, and uh, you know, a culture where everything is going in the right direction. Everybody's pulling in one direction. And finally, where everyone has fun. And fun doesn't necessarily mean parties. It means that you are feeling fulfilled and you are not unhappy about work. The whole concept of a work-leisure balance comes when work is, is something that is not so uh, not so enjoyable and leisure is the enjoyable part of things if you're enjoying work then it's unlikely that you need to think about leisure as a as a uh, or life so called work life if if work itself is fun and life you don't need a, a separate balance so that's my summary and and a brief set of lessons from my life uh, I'm happy to take questions after this. Okay. Dr. Parshram? Yeah, one minute. We just await some anything on the chat box or something. Let me just see. So, Mr. Devarajan, can you? Uh, is there any point you would like to add? You are a leader yourself. I have one uh, one point to make. Can I? Yes, please. Yes, please. Yeah. yeah. Fantastic presentation, uh, uh, Fantastic, really good. You have brought up the entire thing in the uh, management science. See what's happening. The technology is changing. Things also are changing in every field. So the most critical thing, according to what we find, area performance is skill into will. So uh, we can give a lot of skill training for our people, but willingness is going to be the key factor to make the performance successful. So uh, we thought of what are the different areas where we can uh, work to make this happen. Uh, we coined saying that what is KPI? Normally, we have key performance indicator. So the performance, the business performance, and but now things are changing towards key in terms of uh, key performance information. Keep people inspired. Keep people informed. Keep people in inquisitive. That brings a lot of new avenues of the entire team members in our team. So it is not only the, the operators. Operator is going to be the first customer for us, like what you mentioned very clearly. The people are doing the factory. They are the first customer for us. But every area, the skill and will is to be enhanced. I think it came up very well in your presentation. Uh, thank you for all your good points. Yeah, I agree with whatever you're saying. Uh, that is essentially a concept of leadership, doing whatever is needed to make people to improve the culture so that the will is there. The will comes when people are motivated and morale is high and you're all pulling in one direction together. Yeah. Sunil, you have, to, you have anything to ask? Sunil? 
So I have uh, one question, probably a little off the topic. Now, um, like, you, like you mentioned that uh, when you actually grow higher in the hierarchy, you tend to become more, uh, move, move from the doers category to the enablers category. And you also mentioned that the newer generation is actually having a lot of urge in growing fast in the hierarchy, especially. So um, how can the organizations actually manage the situation where the youngsters are there? You are providing them the leadership opportunities also uh, to some extent while keeping them motivated. At the same time, you are also not risking them in some key positions where basically, you know, they are not still capable of leading the team or enabling um, the other people. So how do you manage? I mean, what do you suggest? I mean, can be the solution for this? <clears throat> So I think um, uh, you have to do two things simultaneously. One is that you're uh, that you're uh, you know you have a you have a clear understanding for each individual of what are the learnings that they need in their career to make it to the top of their function. As I mentioned in the case of finance, but it could be marketing person or uh, operations person or whatever. What are the kind of tasks and roles that they need to perform ideally so that they have rounded, uh, you know, uh, rounded learning to become the CXO in that in that function. Right. On the other side, you're saying they don't want to wait to do all these jobs and, and before they. So what obviously what companies are doing these days are they're creating smaller teams and uh, and adding project kind of uh, you know uh, functions so that you're given uh, managerial leadership tasks while still doing some amount of learning of something you know so you're you're not um, you're breaking the hierarchy into smaller hierarchies let us say and allowing people the opportunity to lead smaller teams earlier in their lives Thank you. Thanks. Just wanted to ask you a question, Mr. Biju. Yes, sir. Um, how important is uh, financial control and cost control in effective leadership? How do you build uh, an organization which takes care of that, or is it at all important? I think, um, the, again, there are two answers, right? One is uh, in a strictly formal sense of course you need to have the proper financial controls there should not be uh, fraud there should be you know things are done in a proper way uh, there's a system there's budgeting and all the all the you know all the standard things that we all know about but i think at a philosophical level i mean it's very interesting that you're raising this two days ago i was having a dinner with a set of senior people from my erstwhile companies and we got into a, a discussion, uh, let's say a slightly heated debate. I have always been um, a cost control guy, let me say, right? I've lived all my life in a, in a situation where uh, one felt that any rupee you save for the company is a rupee that you don't have to work hard to generate profit from, for, right? And also that the culture of, of controlling cost is an important one. So I was mentioning that after I retired, I indulged myself, which I never did with company money as long as I was working. Right? Whether it is um, uh, buying Harvard Business Review, which I do on my own money today, but I wouldn't do it with company money when I was working and so on. And uh, what, do I, what do I drink when I have a drink? On company money, I would drink old monk rum. On my own money, I might drink a scotch, you know, that kind of thing. Uh, but the but the current leadership said that we don't agree with you. Uh, today's youngsters are motivated to look at their seniors spending money, living in fancy hotels, um, uh, whatever it is, spending money in a in a in a relatively lavish way, and that is what is motivating them to want to rise. So we must spend as seniors. Uh, we are you know. Now, this is a philosophical question. It's what what do you think about society today? Is this the values you want youngsters to follow? Is this the leadership model that you want? I mean, Gandhi didn't travel in third class train for nothing, right? Not that he couldn't afford something else. 
the chairman of Hindustan Lever through the 80s and 90s insisted on only using an ambassador car, only traveling in, in uh, economy class in India. Uh, people talk about Azim Premji and others not traveling by first class. What does it all mean? I think there's a, there's a, uh, you know, you're trying to set an example as a leader. If, if, if you set the opposite, this is my personal view. I think that that cost control, it is in a. They spend every rupee the way they would spend their own rupees. If they all do it that way, then fine. I think you'll you'll get the appropriate level of control. But if people think that by wasting, they are showing off to their subordinates, that is their value system, and I don't agree with it. Right. Okay. Rupa, if there are, if there is no more questions, you can close the matter. Yes, there, there is a question, sir. There is a question. Sir. Yeah, come, come. Yeah, Mr. Ramesh, please. Yeah, uh, sir. Actually, uh, uh, nice presentation. We had learned a lot from this. In one of the slides, sir, that you have mentioned that uh, there is a ratio of, you know, the highest salary to the lowest salary. So yeah. in India now, in 2016, as you have stated, it is 1 is to 250. Yeah. Uh, so I would just like to ask, sir, because this is an increasing gap in the industrial sector now. So how the employees, which are, you know, not uh, uh, feeling that they are paid well, should be motivated for work? Because... Most of the times, this gap is increasing, and uh, plus in manufacturing sector, it will be more, as we can see. As we are, it's an evident figure for the IT industry. The, the honest truth is that you'll have a hard time with the unions in the negotiation. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sir. You have to. It's a. You cannot uh, hoodwink anybody. People will come to know. These are all things that are announced in listed companies and so on, right? Everybody knows the salaries. So yeah. we have to, I think senior people have to rein in their expectation and really think whether you're adding enough value. Suppose you're, suppose you're, um, suppose you're recruiting a junior person at, for argument's sake, two lakhs a year, okay, a worker. Surely you would expect that the value addition that that one extra person will provide should be eight lakhs or 10 lakhs to justify that one additional person's cost right if that is the case if a ceo is paid three four crores or whatever in a small even a small and medium company today three four crores is there value addition from that person of 10 15 20 crores a year we uh, this is something you know there's a long history to it but essentially uh, ceo remuneration has gone out of control in america mainly because of the the whole structure where the boards are uh, appointed by the CEO and boards are kind of uh, in the pocket of the CEO, then the remuneration committee you appoint uh, essentially scratches the CEO's back, you know, and you appoint, um, you know, Aon Hewitt or uh, Towers Watson you know, or any of these companies. And they will say that uh, 10 other companies are paying four crores, so you must pay four and a half, five crores to attract the best person. Then they will go to the other company when they are consulting for them and say, these fellows are paying five crores. You need to pay six crores to attract the best person. And there is an automatic inflation happening between companies because the same consultants are going around giving them the same advice. So I think there is a fundamental issue that boards and, and governance systems. And in this case, I think um, associations like BCIC, etc., should debate this. Obviously, no individual CEO wants to cut his own remuneration, but somehow the uh, the the body of industrial senior people needs to take cognizance of a problem in society. Otherwise, it'll blow up. And and see how we can control it. I don't. There's no easy answer. I don't know the answer. But this this much we can do. If there's a downturn, think about cutting your own salary before uh, sacking or laying off some people. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Okay. Thank you. There are a couple of questions on the chat box. Oh, both the chat actually related to the uh, uh, both relate to the pandemic and yeah. whether any styles of leadership have changed post pandemic or is it required to be changed post pandemic? Yeah, I my personal view is that fundamentals of leadership 
have been the same 500 years ago, you know, whether it was Joan of Arc, whether it is Gandhi, whether it is, it's it's the same, right? So minor changes in, in environment need some minor adaptation, but fundamentals don't change. Certainly one of the big things is that you have uh, less face-to-face -face contact when you have uh, work, work from home or work from, or in a hybrid way. But then even before, you are not managing only people sitting in your office. If you are running a global organization, you've got people all over the world, you are managing them without the benefits of Zoom, etc. So, you know, in that sense, if nothing changed, in fact, Zoom and things are only helping you, at least now you have face-to-face -face contact. Earlier, you had to do only, you know, on either by travel or through telephone conversations and so on. So in that sense, I don't think it's fundamentally different. Uh, we used to consider in, in uh, career development that one stage is when you first give person uh, supervisory responsibility for people sitting in the same office. And then the next step is when you give them responsibility for people sitting far away. And that difference is quite a big difference in terms of a development. So learning to manage people away from you is a different skill from learning to manage people sitting around you. And even 30 years ago, or 40 years ago, we thought of that as the next step in the development of, of people. So it was always something that we needed to do. As you go up the hierarchy, you need to manage people that you're not in contact with. And now you have to do a lot more of it because of hybrid work. Other than that, I, I personally don't think, OK, there was a lot more of resignations for a while. But that's, you know, things go up and down. There's demand supply changes. If you're running a good organization with a good culture, nobody leaves. If you're not, everybody will leave, regardless of whether it was pandemic or not. Okay. Absolutely. Over to you, Rupa. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, thank you very much once again for uh, such a motivational address, sir. Uh, it's, it's actually a part of our life, what we heard from you. And the suggestions also we'd like to incorporate in our life. Thank you once again. And uh, we would like to have you address in our future endeavor sessions also, sir. Um, thank you very much, sir. Sir, Mr. Vinith Vamasa, would you like to add something, sir? No, I think I've been listening with great interest because whatever Viju has shared today is gone through with all of us as, as we are leading our company. So thank you very much, Viju. I think it was very, very useful, very interactive. I'm sure there's a great deal of learning for the young generation today. So that's about it. And I would look forward to meeting you personally someday soon. Thank you. Thank you all. Yeah, wonderful. Lad. Thank you. We should all thank do you this very in, much, in the future. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.